Religion makes up a huge part of the Crusader Kings III experience, from the many Abrahamic faiths of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, to the far-flung unreformed pagan religions, this subject is a very dense one, but integral to understanding as you expand your realm across the map. In this video today, I want to break down a lot of the mystique behind the religion system. There are so many subjects to talk about, and there are some cool Easter eggs hidden within the system, such as being able to convert to the Greco-Roman religion of Hellenism, worshipping the Greek and Roman gods of old. You'll be able to find chapters in the timeline and description if you'd like to jump to a specific point, but we'll be talking about an overview of religions as a whole, discussing tenets, going over individual doctrines, fervor, holy sites, and concluding our video on reforming or creating your own religion and some tips to do so. And as always, if you've yet to pick the game up, you can find a link in my description to my newly launched storefront on Nexus. The platform gets keys directly from the developer and provides them to you to be placed into Steam, and it's a great way to support the channel, so thank you very much if you decide to use my link. But let's get started on religion, faith, and reforming in Crusader Kings 3. Loading into the game, we have the entire map. And if I press R, we have the entire map divided by religions. So to start our video out, we're going to go over a quick overview of religions, talking about how religious families, faith hostilities, faith organization, how all these things play into the opinion penalties and your ability to kind of move throughout some of these religions. So let's go ahead and click on Catholic. Let's restore the UI. Um, so from here, we can see pretty much everything in this religion. We can see the tenets, we can see the doctrines, the sins, the virtues, all the good stuff. And we can then, if we hover over the top here, we can see what religious family this religion and thus this faith belongs to. So the way the hierarchy of this works is you have three families in the game, Abrahamic, Pagan, and Eastern. Those are your three religious families. Then you have got the religion that belongs to that religious family. In this case, it is an organized Christian religion or faith. And then you have a faith that belongs to that religion. So Catholicism is our faith that belongs to the Christian religion in the Abrahamic family. Hopefully you now understand that kind of hierarchy. And it's important to talk about what we're going to talk about next in faith hostility and how it differs from family to family. So I'm going to flash a quick breakout here of how this works. And you can find this on the Crusader Kings 3 Wikipedia. I'm going to link that in the description. Please go and check this out because there are so many statistics and everything for religion that this will help you out to easily visualize all of this. So faith hostility has four levels, righteous, astray, hostile, or evil. If we uh, Move this over here real quick. You can see we consider them evil. They consider us evil. So this is whenever I click on a different religion, you can see what their hostility is towards us and whatnot. But by hovering over Abrahamic, we get how this religious family deals with different religious families, different religions, and then different faiths. So Abrahamic is evil to other families evil to other religions, and hostile towards other faiths. And they're one of the only religions that is susceptible to heresy. The only other religion outside, of, I'm sorry, the only other religious family outside of this is a specific faith within Eastern, and that is Zoroastrianism. So heresy, think Catholicism. <laughs> so the way this, this breaks out here, you have these four levels of faith hostility. Righteous, astray, hostile, and evil. And at the very top, righteous essentially allows you to um, do things with that other faith. They have, a, they have no opinion penalties towards the character or popular opinion for the individual counties that you run. Uh, they allow for intermarriage, and you can do title usurpation. Also, you cannot do holy wars if you find another faith righteous. If they're astray, then you have a minor penalty of 10 to the character opinion, 15 to popular opinion, and allows for the same perks of intermarriage and title usurpation and no holy wars. But when we get to hostile and evil, things start to spice up. Minus 20 to character opinion, minus 30 to popular opinion, allows for intermarriage, but no title usurpation, and it does allow for holy wars. And evil, you know, it's just going to be the same thing here. It's minus 30 to character opinion, minus 45 to popular opinion, no intermarriage, no usurpation, but yes to those holy wars. So what's important to know about this chart is, if your faith has the pluralist doctrine, then 
all these penalties are halved because you are a little bit more accepting of other religions, other faiths. Uh, it's just a little bit easier going. But if you're a fundamentalist, and you have a fundamentalist doctrine, which, which you would find as part of the main doctrines here. Say we it says we are righteous, which is the middle ground in between pluralist and fundamentalist. So if you look at that, you'll see a fundamentalist will double these penalties, whereas pluralist will have these penalties. So that gives you an idea real quick about how the religion hierarchy works. You can also get quick context clues by looking at the banners themselves. Uh, Muslim banners, for the most part, have this look. Eastern banners have this look. Pagan banners have this look. And both, um, well, I guess just Christian uh, banners have this look. So you can get a real quick little look but just by looking at the tenets. Um, outside of that, though, you have this button right here called Other Faiths. So if you've ever wondered what other faiths are within your religion, you can go ahead and click that button. Or you can just unclick this and see all the faiths in the game, even the ones that are not created or are considered dead. So for example, we brought it up earlier. Here is Hellenism. I've clicked it and it shows me where the holy sites are for Hellenism, as well as its tenets and all the all sorts of goodies here. So if you wanted to quickly navigate through things, you could do that through this. And actually, I found this just recently, so I find it pretty cool to look through. Um, on top of those other faiths, um, you have what is called your faith organization. So Catholicism is organized. The other is unreformed. Those are your two types of faith organization. And they allow for different... I guess you could say benefits depending upon whether you are organized or unreformed. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you how this kind of plays out. So take, for example, my current location. We are an unreformed Baltic faith. We are an unreformed pagan faith. And as an unreformed faith, uh, faith um, we cannot adopt in uh, feudal ways. It is harder for us to convert other lands. Um, the opinion of feudal republic and clan vassals is lessened, and if I hover over this, it shows a lot of these, uh, these, this information right here. Um, also, we get an increase to our, pulp, our monthly prestige by 20%, as you can see right there. Um, the conversion cost to another unreformed faith is zero. We can just jump to another one if we so wish. Just have to pay uh, uh, the cost of itself, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, we get the conquest, Casus Belli still, and we also get a bonus when we're in combat of 10, uh, when we're fighting our we get pagan combat advantage is what it's called and then we can either reform our faith or keep our faith as is versus an organized faith can create other faiths it, it cannot uh reform because it's already been organized and with an organized faith you can adopt feudal ways which you again cannot do if you are an unreformed pagan faith uh, you have a superior uh, conversion bonus, meaning it's easier for you to convert other uh, faiths. You have no opinion penalty with feudal Republican clan vassals. You get no bonuses to monthly prestige, though. You do, though, get a 500% penalty when you want to convert to an unreformed faith. Lose the conquest Casus Belli. Do not get a pagan combat advantage. And again, you can do uh, faith creation versus reformation. Now, that 500% I talked about, let's go ahead and press convert to faith. Now, keep in mind, we are playing as this character. We are unreformed pagan. So I'm going to, again, bring this up. Let's convert to faith. And you see total cost. Well, if you hover over this, it breaks out how that cost works. So the undiscounted doctrine cost is 10,050. Well, it's a different fervor, so there's plus 1%. Well, we have a good amount of learning. That's minus 9%. We're converting to an existing faith, minus 35%. Converting to a different religious family. Remember, we are pagan, and we're jumping now over to an Abrahamic family. That's plus 200%. But we're going unreformed, converting to an organized, minus 25, so on and so forth. So you can see how this breaks out. Now, if I were to switch characters... And I click this, and I click convert to the pagan faith. Look at that, 49,000. The undiscounted doctrine cost is 8,800. So this is where that 500% comes in that I was talking about, plus another 200% converting to a different religious family. That's a 700% penalty.
penalty that you're going to be dealing with. Plus the 50% for feudal ruler converting to unreformed faith. Um, and this is an important one that you saw in probably both of them. The faith is present within or near your realm. So it's easier to convert to faith that you are close to or already exist within your realm. Well, let's jump ahead now to get a little bit deeper into the religion system. Real quick though, before we switch into tenets, something I forgot is about sins and virtues. You can find them at the uh, bottom here, right below your tenets with the sins on the left and the virtues on the right. And as you'll find out how some tenets will influence these, but each faith in a religion will share that religion's primary or at least default sins and virtues, unless you choose a tenet that will swap it out. For example, um, deceitful here, would be a default sin for Christianity. It will always be present unless you use a tenet to swap this out. And you'll be able to find this and we'll discuss this in a little bit as we switch over to the tenet section. Our next section is gonna be about tenets. And this will slightly overlap with doctrines because you cannot talk about one without the other, but we'll go into more detail about doctrines if you want to jump ahead. So let's start out by opening up the religion menu and going to create new. Christian faith. Remember, we can create a new faith because we're an organized religion. Um, otherwise, if we were a pagan religion, we would be reforming it, the, uh, the desired faith. So from here, we get our tenets and our doctrines. And our doctrines are divided up even further by main doctrines, marriage doctrines, and crime and clergy doctrines. For the most part, your doctrines will be independent of your tenets for the exception of your main doctrines. Certain tenets will be barred by your main doctrine selections. There are some other ones that will overlap into this, but for the most part, it's your main doctrines that will influence your tenets. Now, your tenets also give you individual bonuses. Right here, monasticism, courtiers can take vows and become a monk, make temperate a virtue, and makes gluttonous a sin. Um, you can see how much it costs to, to, to acquire this. So your tenets will cost more piety if they are kind of more deviant or not deviant or they deviate more i guess is a better way to say it from the original faith so this is the original tenets of the faith so if i wanted to say be hedonistic it's going to cost me far more because it kind of goes against the existing sins and virtues so i'll give you an example of this so this requires me incompatible with tenant monasticism so you can see it's, it's on the other end of the spectrum mainly because take a look hedonistic makes gluttonous a virtue and temperate a sin, whereas this makes temperate a virtue and gluttonous a sin. So again, like I said, complete opposite ends of the spectrum. So that's important to note too. These sins and virtues at the bottom, there are two different types of sins and virtues. There are normal sins and virtues and then greater sins and greater virtues. Hovering over these, you can see that they all give a minus 10 to faith opinion and a minus one to piety a month. Um, same thing over here. This is going to increase by 10 and increase by one. A greater sin will double that amount. Show you how that works. So hedonistic, we're going to switch to Gnosticism and then just quickly go down here to hedonistic. So when I go back to the virtues, Take a look at gluttonous. Same faith opinion plus 20 now and piety plus 2.0. And if I look at temperate, same faith opinion minus 20, piety minus 20 or 2.0. So these are greater sins and greater virtues. And if I take a look at some other things here, anything that's grayed out like this, I can see requires the doctrine of pluralistic. So if I go to my religious attitude and click on pluralist, I can now go back here and choose adaptive and these are pretty important to look at because you can actually kind of stack up to some of these um, sins so for the most part not every single thing will change your virtues and sins take a look at adaptive and alexandrian catechism nothing changes at the bottom right and it shows you on here if something is going to change that for you so I go to here, asceticism, makes temperate a virtue and makes the following traits sins, gluttonous, greedy, eager, reveler, famous reveler, legendary reveler. So in this case, it not only gives you individual personality traits, but it gives you lifestyle traits that you maybe have gained over the time of playing. So asceticism makes temperate a sin, whereas uh, so does 
hedonistic. So you want to kind of uh, like tie these tenets together and hopefully stack them so you're not increasing your sin amount by an exorbitant amount to the point where you just can't have a character that's not sinful and your virtues to a point where you can control them and have it so that um, enough characters can be virtuous. Because if you kind of really stack these, I think there's another one that's like really has like a ton of sins on here. I get the, the, the uh, where, I guess this is another one, I suppose. But if you really stack this where you have a ton of sins, it makes putting your characters into certain positions a lot harder. Um, also, on the other end of that, if you get the right combination of tenets, you can have it so your virtues are really going to bolster your character. Now, keep in mind too, so some of you might want to choose to not have a theocratic clerical tradition. With a theocratic clerical tradition, it means that you will then lease out your bishoprics to your uh, realm priests or so on and so forth. Lay clergy, you don't do such things. But with that, it then bars certain choices that you've got for your tenets. So I guess my, my big takeaway is if you want a specific set of tenets, take a look at them first, see how much they cost, and then compare what the doctrines you have to sacrifice to do that and make sure it plays in line with the kind of uh, gameplay you want. Remember, like we talked about, pluralists look at um, all of the, the benefits of, I'm sorry, the penalties from faith hostility and halves them versus, say, a fundamentalist doubles them. Also, they have an increase or, ch or a higher chance to deal with um, heresy. So looking at these individual doctrines, which we'll talk about in just a second here, is pretty important to determining how these tenets you want uh, factored into your religion to kind of come to the fore. But again, tenets are super important uh, because they're going to dictate the sin and the virtue of your characters, as well as a lot of passive bonuses that your religion is going to have based on uh, the type of gameplay you have in mind. Doctrines now, on the other hand, differ from tenets because tenets are essentially a number of passive bonuses, but also how the world views you and how you view the world. Take, for example, this tenet. Let me just go down here to uh, syncretic folk traditions. Considers unreformed faiths and is considered by unreformed faiths to be hostile instead of evil. Mutual 30 opinion bonus with unreformed faiths. So again, this is how the world and you kind of interact. Versus doctrines, especially main doctrines, are how you govern your individual realm and how some of the flavor fills into that realm through your marriage, crime, and clergy doctrines. I would argue, yet again, your main doctrines are going to be the most important because they're going to influence how your realm is managed and governed. So looking at view on gender, uh, you can switch between male and female dominated or equal. Now, this isn't so cut and dry. It's not just simply, okay, uh, men and women are in swapped positions. No, it's... It, it creates a lot of different um, roles and dynamics. So for male-dominated, the way that most people will play their Catholic realms when they come into the game, um, enable laws, male and male only, and male preference succession. Obviously, it's going to be the opposite for female-dominated. It triggers female only, and it triggers female preference. What's important to note, though, is this: is that women do not get implicit claims on their parents' titles, and women cannot be granted titles. Only men can be commanders and knights, and only men and vassals can be appointed as chancellors, stewards, and marshals. For female, it's obviously going to be exactly the opposite. So, uh, with a female-dominated realm, if you switch over to this for your faith, keep in mind you're going to have to swap a lot of your uh, vassal positions within your council, who has those titles, so on and so forth down the line, because you now have a female-dominated uh, realm. Religious attitude we've talked about, but just to go over here real quick, fun fundamentalist has an increase to their conversion speed. Counties of other faiths are more likely to join factions and increase danger from heresies when at low fervor and revoke landed titles from hostile and evil infidels without incurring tyranny. Righteous is what you start off with as Catholic, pretty much the, the, the rules that we're all used to. And then pluralist, adherent of other faiths will have opinion penalties of 50%. Uh, county conversion minus 20%, so a little bit slower to convert. Counties of other faiths are less likely to join factions because, remember, you're very uh, easygoing in the most part. 
uh, reduce danger from heresies of low fervor, and winning a holy war will vassalize infidel rulers in the target instead of seizing their land. So with righteous and fundamentalist, whenever you go to a holy war, you wipe out those vassals and you appoint new ones. They become your domain holdings. Pluralist, you're going to vassalize them. Clerical traditions we've talked about a little bit, um, and I'm going to give you guys a link to my vassals video where I explicitly break out all of the math computation, essentially, behind theocratic uh, clerical tradition and how the least realm pays tribute back to you as its liege. The opposite here is lay clergy, wherein secular rulers directly control their own temple holdings. So... I'm going to give that link on the upper right corner, and that'll give you the breakout of how this works. But you can see a real quick example by looking over here at the endorsement portion. Um, and this tells you, you know, okay, there's no current effects because he's not endorsing me. But if I swap over to, let's just hope this guy has endorsements going on. Yay! So Realm endorses you. The taxes you get and the levies you get are going to be uh, generated by hovering over that. You can see it in a real quick little breakout menu there. Going back to the uh, Create New Faith here, we have the Head of Faith as the other main doctrine. So none, obviously there's no Head of Faith. Spiritual, it's appointed, such as the Pope. And then temporal, it is whoever creates the faith is the Head of Faith. And then it then passes down, just like a primary title would to an heir. The difference here too, though, is temporal has to have uh, the lay clerical tradition and not the spiritual revocable clerical appointment, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but moving here into marriage doctrines, for the most part, they do seem to be pretty straightforward, but I do want to go into some of them real fast because uh, we there are just a couple things that maybe weren't as um, cut and dry. So with monogamous, I think we're all pretty familiar with this one, but polygamous, um, for every... For, for polygamy, for every um, uh, uh, wife that you do not have and you have too few, it's minus 0.5 to your piety for missing spouse. So it's just like with consorts and concubines when you're in a feudal, I'm sorry, a tribal nation and you suffer penalties to prestige for not having as many concubines. It's the same thing for polygamy. So can have up to four spouses. So basically that's a total of Minus two piety if you have zero spouses. So you have to fill those up and they'll reduce by minus 0.5 per missing spouse. Um, consorts and concubines, though, again, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, divorcing, pretty self-explanatory. Disallowed, must be approved by either the spiritual head, so in this case the Pope for looking at Christianity, or the head of faith, um, or house head if no spiritual head of faith exists. So that's how that works. Um, then there's always allowed you just spend 100 piety and you you're divorced bastardry has got your three options here with no bastards uh, in which case that ch a child born outside of marriage or concubinage have the wild oat trait versus legitimization any child is born outside of wedlock is a bastard or if they're born from a concubine until you legitimize them then they become a legitimized bastard and then no legitimization makes it so any child born out of wedlock or concubinage is, has a bastard trait. Consanguinity also just has to deal with how close to your family you can get with marriage. With close taboo, it's pretty much um, you can't have uh, any family members married. Uh, and you uh, can't even have sex with anyone else or else you create the incest secret and trait. Um, this moves down to cousins, to pretty much no one that's immediate family, to just unrestricted, have at it, go, go crazy here. And then the crime doctrines is how the game or how your religion views specific traits. So if they have the sodomite trait, the deviant trait, the adulterer or fornicator trait for men or for women, the kinslayer trait, um, or any type of the kinslayer trait. There, I think there's like three total versions of it. Um, there is Kinslayer, Familial Kinslayer, and Dynastic Kinslayer. Um, and then you've got Witch. So crime doctrines will just pretty much be, is it a crime, is it shunned, or is it accepted? And if it's shunned, I'll rubber this, um, then you're just going to get a, a, a penalty to level of devotion, and they'll lose faith. 
So it's just like whenever you see that event for, say, your spy master has slept with this vassal's wife. Well, they lose a level of devotion and they lose piety. That's because it's shunned. If it's accepted, then it's not even a big deal. Also, keep in mind, for any of these doctrines, these crime doctrines, either criminal or shunned, it creates the secret corresponding to it. So, again, well, it is now a secret that this character is a sodomite, or is an adulterer and fornicator, or is a deviant, a witch, so on and so forth. So, keep in mind, you're not just simply looking at the uh, actual decision to reduce their, or their faith and their piety and so on and so forth. You're actually re revealing that secret. Lastly, though, we have our clergy doctrines. And these are actually pretty important, too. I, I would say, in the hierarchy of things, the main doctrine's top tier. Clerical jumps right below that, and the other two are mainly how you want to flavor your realm and how the fun behind it kind of uh, resides. But clergy doctrines is super important because you have three different types of clerical functions. You have control, in which case they increase the control development in your land. Uh, you have alms and pacification, which reduces domain taxes, but increases popular opinion. And then recruitment, where members of the clergy can serve as commanders or knights. This is very similar to what you get with almost all of the pagan religions and having their head of faith, or I'm sorry, their clergy, their chaplains, be uh, champions within your realm. Then we also get the clerical gender, only men, only women, or either. This one's very straightforward. Clerical marriage, allowed or disallowed. And then lastly, clerical appointment. Remember when we took a look at spiritual or the head of faith? Well, if the uh, spiritual, if the appointment is spiritual for life, we cannot change to a temporal head of faith. And you have two options and then two options within those options, spiritual or temporal for life and then temporal or spiritual revocable. And essentially this just means spiritual is appointed by the head of faith. Temporal, it is appointed by the ruler. And for life is obvious. It's you, you put the person in and the only way to remove them is to imprison them because they've done a sin, um, or I'm sorry, not a sin, because uh, they've done a crime or have them murdered through a plot. Other ways that you can try and remove the actual uh, clergy. Um, outside of that though, with revocable, you can swap them out just like you would a normal counselor. But keep in mind, if you do do it, then there is, I believe, either it's a five or a 10 year um, cooldown in between the ability to do so again. If I switch characters back here and we look at this, uh, since we have the ability to do that here, we'll just press swap or uh, I'll sign and fire that guy. So, yeah, it looks like we can't do that for 10 more years. So, just keep that in mind. If you do choose um, temporal and revocable, it has a 10 year cooldown on it. So, that kind of quickly goes over how the doctrines work on a pretty good high level and hopefully you better understand them now and you again just to really quickly recap doctrines are about how your realm is governed and some of the rules that it has to adhere to tenets are essentially how you view the world and how the world views you as well as the coloring of different sins and virtues and how that affects uh, the general opinion of your realm towards those individuals and one last thing before we swap over to holy sites in the crime doctrine section you've got those three options for criminal shunned and accepted well one thing i forgot to mention is that if something is criminal then you can be imprisoned for it and also it would generate a strong hook if the secret was revealed versus shunned which you can't be imprisoned for but it generates a weak hook if it is revealed that's just one real quick thing I wanted to touch on before we swap over to holy sites. Our next subject is going to be about holy sites, and hopefully this one will be a little bit less dense than what we've covered so far. And you've probably already figured this out for the most part, but holy sites will give bonuses to a faith as long as that faith controls its holy site. It doesn't need to necessarily be your direct realm. It can be any um, member of that faith as long as they hold the holy site. Let's take a look here at Catholicism. You can see by selecting Catholicism on the map, again by just pressing R to see all the faiths, we can see all five of the holy sites spread across the map. An easier way to access this would just be by clicking the holy sites tab up here, and I can see all of them and their bonuses as well as who holds them. So we can see that four of the uh, five holy sites right now are controlled by Catholic rulers. But Jerusalem is not. So 
This immediately tells me that this is grayed out. I'm not going to be able to get the bonuses, but all Catholics receive these bonuses for each individual site. Click here and go immediately to the location and it will warp there one way or another. So holy sites are important because every single faith has about five, some have six or seven, but these will give you permanent bonuses in the game. And depending on your tenets, they might also give you additional bonuses. For example, Ecclesiarchy provides a bonus to monthly fervor for every holy site that is controlled by the faith. And it's important to note too that some holy sites are shared. I, I, and most, you know, the, uh, the best example here would be Jerusalem, which is shared by Orthodox Christianity, which is shared by Muslim faiths, by, I think, the Kushite faith. I don't know, Kushite faith is uh, Alexandria. But a lot of different Muslim faiths all also share that. The Coptic faith, which is a different Christian faith, shares it. So Jerusalem is going to be a hotly contested site. Um, I think that kind of went without saying. But even looking at the pagan um, locations, we get ones that are shared. So take a look at this location right here, right? Um, this is also shared by Slovakianism. So right there. So not all sites are mutually exclusive to a, a faith. And when we look at these individual faiths, if you control a holy site, more often than not, you will have a special building that corresponds to that site, some sort of great temple or grand temple or uh, the Hall of Heroes. There are certain things that correspond to it. And it all depends upon the religion and who holds that faith or that, that uh, holy site. Because the building over here, go ahead and bring this back up, over here is different for this religion than it is for this religion. So just keep these things in mind and they will give you different benefits too. Uh, but this is just kind of a, a quick um, top-down view of holy sites. I feel like I should include them here if anywhere. But let's talk about now fervor. Fervor is another pretty important aspect of Crusader Kings 3 religion system that is not really explained very well. Fervor is essentially, you know, how righteous the adherents are of a specific faith, ranging from 0 to 100%. And it affects a number of things. One of the biggest things that it affects is the ability to create a new faith within a faith. In addition to that, it also affects how much it will cost you to convert a county within the faith. So if you have a high fervor and you're converting a county of lower fervor where it has a different religion, then it's easier for you to convert versus the opposite. That seems very self-explanatory, but let me show you an actual real life example here. So um, this is our lovely kingdom of Lithuania. We're gonna bring up our religion and we can see that we are a reformed version of this pagan religion. We, and as does, we have 100% fervor. So fervor is immediately set to 100% when you create a new religion or you reform a religion. All the historical ones start at 50%. So and we're going to come back to fervor here in just a second, but let me show you uh, what I mean by that example of the faith difference. So let's bring up our court chaplain. Let's press convert faith in a county. And let's hover over one of the old versions of our faith. Now, I unfortunately can't hover over this specific menu to show you exactly where I'm looking. But if you take a look at monthly progress and we jump down three, it says fervor, vitalism versus old vitalism. Now it says plus 72. Since I've already taken a look at this, and I will tell you how the math works, our fervor is 100. Theirs is 68. That number difference is 32. So your penalty or your bonus is the fervor difference at, point, at a 0.02 per fervor. So at 32, by a 0.02 per fervor, we're getting a point. 72 bonus to the monthly progress of converting this county. Now, if this was swapped, we would be at negative 0.72 because they've got 100 and we've got 68. And that's how that worked. But I wanted to explain that because that's probably the largest application of fervor and how it will apply directly to your, your gameplay. I um, mean, it is important to note. But fervor itself will increase monthly. Yeah. There we go. Fervor itself will increase, increase at a base 0.3 a month, as you can see right there. And then there are other things that will either uh, modify or detract from this. Things such as uh, those events that say there is a sinful bishop, archbishop, or a sinful head of faith can affect the fervor growth per month. 
example here is the size of the faith. So whenever a faith grows over 20 counties, it starts to suffer a penalty from its fervor. In addition to that, your fervor will then be influenced by whether or not there are holy wars. If you are the defender in a holy war, depending on if it's a county, duchy, or kingdom-wide holy war, you will get a bonus to fervor of 3, 5, or 10. And I'll show you again a real-life application of this. If you are the aggressor in a holy war, you will suffer a penalty of 3, 5, or 10. So remember, defenders get a bonus, and then uh, aggressors get a penalty. So just to kind of... Um, creates the narrative of, we are using this holy war to accomplish this objective, we have accomplished it, it's reduced some of our fervor, but the people who we took this from have been increased in their fervor to try, try and take it back. So let me go ahead and just select Poland, declare a war, and we'll, I'll show you this real quick. So the county, holy war for county, all the way at the bottom here, the our parent religion's fervor decreases by three, and theirs increase, uh, uh, increases by three. So ours decreases by three, theirs increases by three. Duchy, five and five. And then kingdom, 10 and 10. Now, some other things with fervor. This pertains to the Abrahamic faiths because they are subject to heresy as well as Zoroastrianism. If you have low fervor, this increases the likelihood for a chance of an outbreak of heresy. And the heresy will trigger at below 40% um, fervor. So let me click on Orthodox. They have 37%. And you can see that they're getting a bonus from their holy sites, the base of 0.3, and the size of their faith is massive. So it is giving them quite a big penalty. But since they are so low in fervor, they're at a point now where they can start to uh have heresies occur and the chance increases for every 10 percent below at obviously um 40 30 20 10 0. so um <clears throat> when the actual outbreak occurs then those people can uh, join a new faith and it will actually add 15 percent fervor to your faith so it allows you to kind of um get those religions back in order so that's how I wanted to go through fervor real quick because a lot of people had some questions about it and how to increase it. So you can see that just simply living a life according to the virtues, having your, your realm ruler according to the virtues will help increase your fervor. Uh, being the defendant in a holy war will help, or the defender in a <laughs> defender in a holy war, not, not in a court of law, uh, will help out with increasing your fervor and also making sure that your um uh, you're not dealing with any kind of simple situations, such as your head of faith or archbishops getting in simple acts. You can't really control those. So fervor is not something you can ultimately really um, influence outside of just um, controlling it by not doing as many holy wars, because those will greatly reduce your fervor over time. We're going to close our video out here talking about how to create your own faith or how to reform your faith. And both of these will cost you piety here. Now, your piety is influenced by a number of things. It can be your ruler himself, whether or he is sinful or if he is virtuous. Um, it can be dependent upon certain skill perks that you've got. Take, for example, the learning skill tree. Some of these will really help you out. Take, for example, profit. This is going to help out with monthly piety per night by 1%. Also, it's going to help you in what you want to do with either a faith creation or reforming your religion by reducing the cost by 50%. So um, rather than me going through every single way to increase your piety, I'm going to link you back to the Crusader Kings 3 Wikipedia because it has two massive, massive lists on what will penalize and what will benefit your piety. So really the, the key to keep increasing your piety, if like you're say, okay, today is the day I want to do my new faith or ref reformation. You want to be on a theology of focus just because that's going to increase your piety by one. You want to get anything that's going to increase your piety by a certain amount. Profit is a good example. Monthly piety per night plus 1%. Um, you're also going to want to go on pilgrimages. You're going to want to set your wife to patronage, which will help you out. Because if you select your character and hover over learning, piety is increased by point, or it's um, it's basically move the decimal point one over, and there you go. Uh, piety is 
point or a plus 1.4 per month because we have 14 learning. So increasing your learning substantially will help increase your piety. Now, when you increase your piety, you will increase your levels of devotion from sinner to dutiful to faithful to the devoted servant to paragon of virtue to religious icon. Right here, all of our necessary ones. And each one will give you a bonus or a penalty to clergy opinion, theocracy vassal tax, and levies, and the max holy war objective rank, as well as the ability to create holy orders and consecrate bloodlines. So let's go ahead and over over devoted servant. This is what it gives us, plus 10 to, to the clergy opinion. A religious icon gives us a plus 30. A religious icon is the fifth and highest level of devotion. And again, it depends upon if you have uh, the theocracy that allows for um, the clergy to pay. We have theocratic, so the, they will lease out those temple holdings and pay us both levies and taxes. Um, at the religious icon, it's a max of 55% uh, taxes and 50% levies. At Paragon of Virtue, it's 45% tax, 40% levies. At Devoted Servants, 35% and 30%. 25 and 20, 15 and 10, down to zero and zero for a sinner. No realm priest is going to give money to a sinner. I'll tell you guys that. And as far as your max holy war objective, it starts at county with dutiful and progresses up to kingdom at paragon and then at a religious icon at all to uh, kingdom. So that's a quick breakdown on piety, but that is going to be the resource you use to create your Christian faith. Now, you can also convert to another religion that is, you know, let me just do something else on the map. You can convert to this and you can hover over this location that we talked about at the very beginning of the video to show you what is penalizing this number or what's discounting this number. Um, and there are a number of ways you can affect that. If you are cynical, you'll see that this has a faith conversion cost of minus 20% because you're converting to another faith, not creating one. Also in the learning tree, we have apostate minus 75 to faith conversion cost. So if you have uh, apostate and cynical, it's minus 95%. You can also use two buildings on the map to reduce those as well. They're kind of scattered all over the place, but this is Stonehenge for minus 20% in uh, England. And then if we swing all the way down over here to India, we can grab another one at Temple City, which will give us another further minus two uh, conversion cost by 20%. That's not really the focus of what we're going to talk about, but I wanted to at least bring it up in case you wanted to convert to Hellenism. That would allow you to do it and help buffer the massive minus 500% uh, penalty you'll have to deal with with resurrecting a dead religion. So let's press convert or create new uh, uh, Christian faith. And I've set this up here to be the temporal head of faith. And why this is important, because we talked about tenets and doctrines. Doctrines, for the most part, are going to be however you want to play. And tenets are going to be based off of what you'd like out of your campaign. So I'm going to talk about a couple tenets I think are very strong and very good. You can, again, choose the ones that you want the most. But communion is super strong because uh, you know how you can ask the Pope for indulgences or you can ask him for money? Well, this makes you the head of the religion if you are the head of faith, temporal, creator of the religion, the head of the faith. And communion makes it so they ask you for indulgences, in which they will do all the time. So this is a great way to make a ton of money because they're constantly going to be throwing you money in order to absolve their sins. So this is a really, 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 really strong one. Um, there are quite a few on this list, actually. So this is another one as well. Um, this one will allow you to commit suicide for the most part whenever you want. So this way you can determine when you want your heir to take over. This is very powerful because you might have a really strong, genius, beautiful um, Herculean child, but he's your first kid and now he's 38 and you're 42. Well, that doesn't make much sense. <laughs> you, yeah, you, you had him when you were four years old. But my point being exactly like you had him when you were uh, 16 and so he's been pretty much 16 years behind you the entire way. So this allows you to commit suicide and swap over to your heir at a time that you think is most beneficial. Also, it reduces the short reign duration by 50%, which is really powerful because it's one of the biggest things you deal with, with the difference between long reign to short reign. 
Another one on this list here is, let's go down here. Gnosticism can be quite strong. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it, but I've, I've looked at it as far as a, a great way to kind of control your, your government a little bit. Monasticism is very strong because you can make courtiers take vows and become monks. So it's kind of like a, like a, a diet way to uh, disinherit someone. Um, let's go down a little bit further here. Where is ritual celebration? Here we go. So ritual celebrations is also pretty powerful. And this allows you to host a feast that earns you piety. And then vassals are more likely to attend your feasts. Those who still refuse to come will lose piety in doing so. Uh, you can become obese doing this. So be mindful of that. That, that is a, uh, an option for you. So, so don't go crazy with it. But still, it does offer the, avail the, the ability to increase piety by doing feasts and also increases the benefit to both vassals and courtiers who attend those uh, feasts. Now, one of the strongest things about playing a tribal character is the conquest Cassus Belli. Well, Pursuit of Power reintroduces that to you if you are feudal. Rulers have a conquest Cassus Belli against neighboring rulers. Prestigious rulers can use an invasion Cassus Belli once per lifetime. So they have got that option back on the table for them. And maybe you're having an issue with um, fervor and fervor not being able to, you really can't just get a hold of it. Well, pacifism right here enables it so that you cannot declare holy wars or raid. This is, it might seem like, oh man, this is a huge issue. Well, it just means you just have to forge your claims or you have to marry into, into claims. Because holy wars, like we said before, at 3, 5, and 10 fervor reduction are a pretty scary way to get invited into a lot of heresies. So these are some really good tenets that I would choose if I was creating my own faith. Um, there are plenty of other options that you can go by. Um, a lot of people really think, I, I personally also agree that communion is a really strong one. And I also really enjoy monasticism. Um, communal identity, identity is another really strong one here. Uh, this will help out with conversion speed, promoting culture, and um, making it so that making those different cultures and different religions as a little bit less impactful on you. Um, but those are some of my big picks for tenets. I would try to, again, reduce the amount of sins and virtues being too large. Uh, obviously, having a higher amount of virtues is going to be beneficial, but having too many sins on the table is going to make it so that every single character has a chance to be a pretty impactful sinner upon you, and you do not want to deal with that. But that kind of uh, rounds out how to create your own Christian faith, and hopefully my tips on how to increase piety and reducing the cost here will really kind of curb you jumping into doing this. Uh, again, too, you can fluctuate a number of these crime doctrines and clergy doctrines. Um, I actually kind of find that control to be pretty advantageous, but I also really like recruitment to allow it that to allow you to have your um, your chaplain have just a little bit more staying power. Also, it increases levy reinforcement rate rate by 30 percent, which is quite nice. Um, also making it so the clerical gender is either is quite nice as well. Just to keep in mind, though, any doctrine that you change um, from the parent one is going to be increased substantially depending on the difference. So criminal at 56 is what it's, sta it's, what it's standard um, uh, faith, uh, Catholic faith was before. Jumping to accepted, you can see that it has a much more or significant piety cost to do that. That's reflected right here. So it's at 3531. Now just jump down to 3418. So be mindful of what you're, you're choosing. You don't want every single one of these to be a new one because now if I do that, it's just going to rack this price point up and I am going to be looking at a really crazy. So now it's like at 4152. And just because I've, I've selected everything to have a different option. So when you're doing that, be um, really aware of it. Also the same thing, like I've said with tenants before, uh, the further this departs from the original tenants of the faith, the more uh, you'll be paying in the piety to do so. And our last subject before closing our video out is about reforming your religion. So this is gonna act very similar to creating a faith within a religion. And for the most part, it's gonna be exactly the same. The biggest difference here is that you need to hold three of the holy sites of this pagan faith or religion. And you can see right here that we've got one, two, three. 
we're going to bring up the religion menu and then just simply press reform down here at the bottom and we're going to get the exact same menu that we've gotten with creating a religion now uh, i'm sorry creating a faith now the big difference here is that your tenets will be different in fact they'll be different from every religious family you're looking at either pagan eastern or abrahamic so really dive through some of these tenets um some are shared between all of them some stuff like the um gnosticism is shared or any of the syncreticisms are shared between all of the religions for the most part because you're basically saying are you um uh i guess sympathetic towards that religion so they have the ability to to kind of cross uh, the boundaries here but some really important ones for uh, pagan religions that i want to point out is this one right here so mothers are less likely to die in childbirth children are less likely to be sickly after they're born or stillborn and then fertility is increased by 10 percent ancestor worship is also really uh, strong here as well because it increases the prestige from your level of splendor when you're getting married for your newborns so this gives you more um prestige to use as you kind of push through your uh, different uh, generations sanctity of nature also is pretty nice here it helps you out with uh, jungles forests and taigas um, but some other stuff that are really some other things that are really good is human sacrifices this allows you to do executions to earn piety to really ramp that up quickly but also it'll grade you the, or grant you the uh, raid for captives cast belly which is really strong if you want to help increase and fill out your court a little bit more because you can raid those captives and recruit them rather than sacrificing them which is quite nice um, but also some of the other things that we talked about are still relevant in pagan religions so you can use communion here to get the same exact benefits that we talked about in creating a faith. Um, another one that takes the, I think, yeah, okay. So pursuit of power is present in pagan, but warmonger is as well. So if you want to be uh, very geared towards um, being offensive and going into a lot of wars, warmonger is good because you're swapping out at peace opinion with offensive war opinion. So uh, by standard default play, uh, for being over six months of in an engagement, a long war as it were, you get an offensive war opinion modifier. So a penalty to all from all your vassals. Now with warmonger, this gives you an at peace opinion um, penalty. So if you're at peace for too long, your vassals start to get a little riled up. So. Um, kind of weave your way through these and see which ones make the most sense for you. Um, some of them are really cool, you know, like sky burials here. Rulers can give their ancestors a sky burial, gaining piety and pleasing their vassals. Also, another really awesome one is, um, where is it? Basically, it's the ability to, ah, there it is, reincarnation. So children have a chance of being considered as the reincarnation of an ancestor, giving bonuses to piety and opinion. And there's also a lot of really cool events and, and flavorful, awesome things that happen if you are reincarnated. So this one's a really, 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 really cool one. So definitely take a look at these tenets and see how they play alongside the campaign you have in mind for your new reformed pagan faith. And once you do uh, reform, here, I'll just press the reform button. Um, I can show vassals and it'll show me that for the most part, all of these vassals will convert. They'll convert, we'll press create. And you'll see that the old unreformed religion here um, changes its name. And over time, this will start to fill out. Uh, your vassals might convert some of their vassals, and you can even ask your, uh, your vassals to convert, and that's kind of a cool way to, to push this through. But your religion, the Reformed religion, becomes the new name, and the old one now just becomes old. So hopefully this helps you out in understanding faith, in understanding religions, religious families. I know this video was very, very dense, and I didn't make this video thinking it would actually be as dense as it truly is but religion is a very complex um, subject in life as well as crusader kings 3 so if you do have any other questions please by all means go ahead and let me know in the in the comment section below um, i'll do my best to answer them or if you want to share some tenets or some doctrine combinations that you've really had a lot of success with please 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 share those below to kind of try and spread that information as much as possible but as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below, all that fun action. But have a good one and take care.